and insulin resistance is going to um, impair that vasodilation. It, it does. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So not only does that explain the incredibly intimate connection between hypertension and insulin mm-hmm. resistance, but even in men, it is considered to be one of the earliest um, instances of how insulin resistance is driving erectile dysfunction. So the most common form of infertility in men is directly attributable to some degree to this metabolic problem that is insulin resistant. Jeez. It's like it, it's the root. It's the foundation. Amen. Of pretty much yeah. everything. So it brings it's meaning wild. in my career. Why it would does. I devote a career? You're so important. <laughs> yeah. But that's also why when I when I started putting these thoughts together, you know, in the form of, of my book, Why We Get Sick, which you've been nice enough to put here. I know. It's so good. I, I actually had to go through several versions of the title. So good. The, the first version of the book was insulin resistance, you know, why it matters or something. Yeah. But yeah. I knew no one would care. Mm. Most people hear the word insulin and think of it no further than the context of, well, it's a, a drug for diabetes. They just think of it as a medic. Some people don't even know we make insulin. That's a normal hormone. Yeah, so insulin is a, a peptide hormone, a, a little petite peptide that is made, produced from the beta cells of the pancreas. Now, the main stimulus of telling the beta cells to release insulin is blood glucose, blood sugar. So now that then is a separate thing, not a hormone. It's a nutrient or, or an energy source or calorie source. So we ingest the Apple Jacks. Yep. And then what happens? Yep. That's, yeah, great. So we eat a starch or a sugar. And then to some degree, that's going to be digested. Mm -hmm. But every carbohydrate to some degree is going to get broken down into blood sugar, a lot or little, rapidly or very slowly. But as blood glucose levels start to climb, that will stimulate the beta cell to release insulin. And in this context, insulin is acting as a hero. If glucose levels are too high for too long, it is acutely lethal. Mm -hmm. We need to correct it. And there's no other nutrient that does this, by the way. If you eat, if you and I were to eat a load of fat, fat would have a very slow, like we ate a stick of butter. We would notice this very slow creeping increase in our triglycerides and it would come back down. If we ate a load of protein, we'd see amino acids go up and then come back down. Glucose Nothing changes like glucose does. Carbohydrates are non-essential. They are not essential. Uh, that is controversial. And most it's people will hear us say this and they will yeah. think, well, but the body needs glucose. Blood glucose is not the same as dietary carbohydrate. The liver has the ability to create all the glucose the body needs. So back to the glucose exchange or excursion, glucose goes up to a really high. Insulin acts as the hero saying, hey, you're too high. Mm-hmm. I'm going to bring you back down. And so among its many effects Mm -hmm. from top to bottom, it will go to the biggest tissues of the body by mass, fat mass, and muscle mass. And so insulin will come to the doors of the muscle, knock on the doors, open the doors when insulin's working well, and then allow the glucose, acting like a gatekeeper, to come from the blood into the muscle, thereby lowering blood glucose, ideally, quite quickly. And then we've ret- we've returned and to homeostasis. That, and a person who can do that would be considered to have good insulin sensitivity. That's right. Glucose levels can come up and down. Ideally, um, with monitoring devices, we'd want to see glucose levels get back down to around 100 milligrams per deciliter by about two hours. That's a good sign. Okay. So there is value in the dynamic testing of glucose that we don't get with just a Which once. Which you can annual. do with a, a continuous glucose that's monitor. Right. And that's yeah, rather than really like a one time a year, we fast right. to get our blood drawn. And right. Get... And there's so many confounders that can there are. influence that mo- yeah. one moment in time. That's right. Yeah. But insulin will, insulin doesn't come down as quickly. It sort of lingers mm-hmm. in order to determine, all right, is everything back to normal here? Okay, it is now. I'll go away. And so insulin, even in an insulin sensitive person, can stay elevated for up to three hours mm-hmm. just with even a modest amount of carbohydrate consumed. And unfortunately, in our modern environment, not only uh, do we have that three-hour window of insulin, but if you're an insulin-resistant person, you could eat that same carbohydrate load, and now insulin might be elevated for five or six hours. Mm. Well, long before insulin has even had a chance to come back down, we've spiked it again because we have this culture of chronic carbohydrate consumption. So we start the morning off with a bowl of starchy, sugary foods, Mm. and then we have a mid-morning snack or sugary drink, Mm. and then we do the same thing for lunch. And throughout the day, so we're spending every waking moment so our insulin in a state of elevated so insulin. So hard. Yep. And yeah. like happens so often, too much of a signal results in a deafening to that signal, 
So insulin no longer becomes responsive, insulin resistance. That's right. Yep. So too much insulin is the main driver of insulin resistance. And our our carb-crazed culture is what's driven it. 